and welcome to another Sunday Talk Within the Nine-Sided Circle. I'm one of your two hosts, Noor Kyle, along with... And I'm one of the hosts that is not Noor Kyle, Mushtaq Ali. Yep. Uh, okay, so thank you so much for joining us. We have many people here with us today. And we have many of you watching us on YouTube. Thank you so much for being here. You know what's exciting? We are watching our subscriber number tick up, which is awesome because as many of you know we are doing our best to get to a thousand so that we can hopefully get onto the youtube partnership program in order to not monetize our channel but actually consciously demonetize we hope to get rid of commercials altogether because many of them do not speak to what we are offering here and we know that they're disruptive to the content we don't like them any more than you do so thank you so much for helping us out, everyone who has subscribed already. And if you haven't, yeah. we invite you to. That would make yeah. us so happy. We're getting so close, you guys. Yeah, we are 18 subscribers away from hitting 1,000 as of this afternoon. Yes, it's a very big deal. It's taken us a while to get here, but it is becoming more and more... Uh, it's just so close. You're yeah, so close. and we've done this without having to take out advertisements or paying people to try and promote us or anything like that. It's completely yeah. organic, as they say. All of those subscribers that you see, all of the comments we get, all of this is organic, which is amazing to us. As we often say, we never expected it to get to be this impactful, and we are hoping to do the best we can with the platform we have to really practice what we teach even in terms of how we interact on youtube so thank you so much for that so what else can we share i guess uh you know the typical like comment subscribe thing that definitely yeah. means that yeah some of you guys do such good comments yeah. some of them are a little long but that's okay um we're not we try and get, for that. Yeah, yeah, no, we're trying to get to them. Uh, but I look forward every day to seeing the comments because a lot of them are really thought-provoking. So make comments. Even if you don't agree with everything we say, and God, I hope you don't agree with everything we say because that would be a funny old world. Um, yeah, make a comment or two. And to the one guy who always is hating on our videos, there's only one of you. We know that. You should make a comment too. Tell us why you hate our videos. Uh, as long as you stay away from pejoratives and ad hominem attacks, we'll post it. We'll talk with you. We'll have fun with it. So, yeah. Yeah. Dialogue is, you know, it's vital to the stuff that we have going on here. And we are inviting that in. Other than that, do we have any announcements to make? Um, buy our t-shirts. <laughs> Look down in the, the description and go buy one of our t-shirts. They're cool. They don't yep. even have our name on them. Nope. So it's, it's, you, you can wear it anywhere. It doesn't advertise us. It's just a cool logo that, yeah. you know, get to help us, uh, but our pretty picture all over the world. If you want Not to, to it. mention, it's a great <laughs> conversation starter in the coffee shop. True, true story. Yeah. Yes. Yes, awesome. Aaron says he's got two on my wish list. Awesome. I'm psyched to hear that. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, so we should get started. Yeah. So we're gonna have fun with this uh, this week. I was really pleasantly surprised when last week's video kind of uh, uh, I wouldn't say went viral but for us went viral uh, in that we got lots more views than I was expecting lots more comments than I was expecting um, yeah and all the good things we had a great conversation that talk yeah we did too so uh, this, and since then, I have read the book that I was talking about, uh, the Manhattan Cult Story, uh, 
cover to cover finished it was absolutely fucking horrified by what I read. I mean, it, it, it is even worse than I imagined. If possible, it might even be worse than that other group I was talking about. Um, so, because of the way they operate, uh, it, we have been moved to make sure that there are no secrets. That self-remembering is not some secret process. That self-observation is not some secret process. None of this stuff was secret. The things that we're talking about, Gurdjieff got from Sufis. He didn't get everything from Sufis. But certain things like self-remembering, uh, self-observation, those are Sufi practices that, I mean, you can look them up in the encyclopedias of Sufism and find them and find descriptions of them and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, so we're going to put them out there and exactly how to do them. Uh, we're going to do two more. Uh, next week is our double talk, our morning and afternoon talk. And that's going to be a two-parter to cover the last two of these that we want to cover. Yep. And... Uh, so yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah. Two talks Sunday next week, 10.30 a.m. Pacific Daily Time, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Daily Time on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, and we're going to make sure that anybody can know these things without having to pay lots of money and without having to swear to secrecy and to actually be told how it's done. Um, just because it would be fun to drop a monkey wrench in the gears of people who do things like this this group did which is not to say necessarily that the practice will be mastered in an instant these are things that yeah. do take conscientious diligent effort to master but that does not mean that they are inaccessible and i think that's the key here for us is that the work should be accessible yeah, and if you understand what the work actually is, you can't be manipulated into thinking that it's something else and then have that used as a lever against you. Yeah, or, you know, be shamed into compliance because you, you realize that questions are unwelcome in a way that means you're going to be shamed publicly for asking them. So... That's why we're doing, uh, we're revisiting self-observation today. So, self-observation. Um, in Arabic, it's called mahasabeh. And this means uh, to take account. Um, and it's a very important practice. And we're going to go over exactly how one does it. We're actually going to do it. We're going to go through a process, each of us, of self-observation so that uh, you can have a felt sense of what it is actually like. And before that, we are going to teach you the first sensing exercise. Gurdjieff is always talking about sensing, but as I discovered in reading this book, uh, some people don't tell you what that is and how to do it. Sensing is designed to put you in your body. Your body is um, the only tool you have for experiencing the world. Your body is the witness to the universe, or you are the witness to the universe through your body, or however you want to say it. You got to have a body to do this, or you have to be a body. And without it, you know, you'd be what, a, a floating head? You know, a mind floating in space, you'd dissolve because there's nothing to hold you in. This is your interface. Yes. This is where you meet the world. This and is it is me. your tool for self-awakening. Yeah, it is you being in the world. 
So, would you all like to learn the first sensing exercise? And there was silence. <laughs> Come on, kids. Give us a thumbs up. Now, how excited. about this? Does yeah. anybody not want to learn it? Because if you, if you will remember in various talks that we've done, the idea of uh, affirmative consent is very important to us. Uh, and so if you are going to teach somebody something, you need their consent to do it. You need their permission, which is revocable at any time. And this is an important lesson in relation to the concepts we've been discussing around uh, manipulation and coercion and all of that. Affirmative consent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, since nobody's jumping up and saying no, though I don't hear a whole lot of yeses, and the affirmative consent thing is like, yes, I want to learn this. You did have some thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, thumbs up will do. So, thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm looking at all of you. Yay. Good. Did we, did we not miss it? Did we miss anybody? No, we didn't miss anybody. I don't think. Omar, are you down? He's down. All right. Okay. And it's driving. Why yeah, so it? she doesn't want to do this right now anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> Anna, don't do this right now. This is not safe to do in a car. Yeah. So, what we're going to do is we're going to find a way to sit comfortably, which for me is a little bit harder than it is for a lot of people. There we go. Ah. Oh. So, we're sitting comfortably and we're going to close our eyes. We're going to put our hands on our laps with the palms up, like this, palms up, on your legs, somehow. Now, if you're right-handed, you are going to start with your right hand. If you're left-handed, you're going to start with your left hand. I'm going to talk it through for uh, the right hand, uh, and if you're left-handed, just reverse the instructions. So, and if any moment you feel like this is too much, you can open your eyes. That's yeah, okay. just just stop. Yes. We start with the eyes closed. And what we're going to do is we're going to put our attention and our awareness in our right hand. So feel the fingers, feel the palm of your hand, feel the back of your hand, and notice that you can stay awake while you're doing this. This is not for going into a trance. This is for staying out of trance. So allow your awareness to move from your right hand up into your wrist and from your wrist into your forearm and from your forearm to your elbow and from your elbow to your upper arm And now I want you to notice that you can hold everything in your awareness at the same time. Your hand, your wrist, your forearm, your elbow, your upper arm. And feel it all. Now, move your awareness up into your right shoulder. Or your left shoulder if you're left-handed. And spread it along your collarbone until it reaches your center line. Then begin dropping it down from your shoulder and your collarbone into your torso, into your upper chest, just on the right side. And then down into your lower chest, your diaphragm. Then down into your abdomen. And then into your pelvic girdle and feel your pelvic girdle and stop there and notice that you can feel everything from the tips of the fingers on the right hand all the way down to the pelvic girdle all at once. Then go down your right leg from your hip bone to your knee. And then from your knee, go all the way down to your calf then your ankle 
And then put your attention and your awareness in your right foot. From here, you're going to move from your right foot to your left foot. Put your awareness in your left foot. You can hold all of the other places that your attention and your awareness has touched in your experience and your left foot as well. Then move up to your left ankle and your left calf in your left knee, up your left thigh to the hip socket, and notice at this point you can stop for a second and feel everything that your awareness has touched so far. And then move up through the left side of your pelvic girdle, up through the abdomen, the lower chest, the upper chest, all the way up to your left shoulder and your left collarbone. Then stop and feel all of that for a second and notice that you're holding most of your body in your awareness. Now, go down your left arm from the shoulder through the upper arm to the elbow to the forearm and then into your left hand. Stop there and notice that you can feel your whole body from the neck down and your awareness being held in both of your hands or both of your hands being held in your awareness and that you can still be awake. You don't have to go into a trance doing this. You can be completely here and present and do this. Now, bring your awareness up your left arm from the left hand up to the shoulder to the neck and bring it up your right arm from the right hand up to up into the shoulder and neck and there let them meet in the middle and then let them move upward through your neck, up through your face up through your head, the back of your head, all the way to the top. Notice that you can hold your whole body in your awareness. You can actually sense your body. Now, I want you to move your tongue around in your mouth as if you were trying to taste the inside of your mouth. Rub it on the top of your palate Rub it along your teeth. Feel the inside of your mouth with your tongue and notice if you have any sensation of taste. Once you've done that, I want you to listen. What can you hear? Yes, you can hear the sound of my voice, but what other sounds are there around you? Can you hear traffic outside? Can you hear voices in another room? Can you hear birds singing? What do you hear? Just sense the hearing and notice that you still have the awareness of your body. Once you've allowed yourself to hear what is in your environment, I want you to open your eyes and let the perception of sight come into your eyes. Let yourself see whatever is around you, whether it's the screen of your computer, whether it's the room behind it, the quality of light, everything. You can even look around and see what you can see. Once you've done that, I want you to expand your nostrils and take in a breath as if you were trying to smell the room. Take several good, good sniffs of the room. See if there's anything you can smell in it. And 
when you've done that, feel your whole body one more time. Notice that you can sense your entire body. You can sense your mouth and any taste in it. You can hear the world, you can see the world, and you can smell the world. And then take a big deep breath and bring your focus back to here, to what we're doing. This is the basic sense, sensing exercise. And it reflects the ways our senses open when we are first born. When a human child is born, their first sensation is touch, feeling their body. Their second sensation is taste. Their third sensation and their first really outer sensation is hearing. Hearing comes before seeing. Then comes seeing, then comes smell for a human. It's different for other animals. Every animal has a, a different way of, of their senses activating in babyhood. But for humans, this is the pattern. And so by recapitulating that pattern, we <coughs> learn to reconnect to our sensory apparatus. And uh, when I was learning this, it was recommended to do this every morning upon getting up to set the senses for the day. Not that I'm recommending that you guys do that, but this is the basic sensing ex exercise. Super secret sensing exercise. Super secret sensing exercise. You know, a lot of people who purport to teach the work talk about sensing without ever telling you how to do it. So, now you know one way to do it. It's not the only way. It is the only right way, but just kidding, guys. It's the way I learned. Um, and I've always liked it. So, questions. How do you feel after that? Did anybody go to sleep? Fall into a, a little trance? It's okay if you did. Maybe yeah, it's all right if you did. It's, it's easy, especially if I'm talking to you like that, it's, it's easy to let go into the speech. It is easier to stay out of a trance if you're doing this to yourself, with yourself? Yeah, so Lavita said that she did not fall asleep. Aaron says, I feel pretty awake. Yay. Uh, I always find when I'm out walking that if, if I do that, that's sort of uh, on a walk, opening up mm -hmm. your senses to everything. It's just, it's a, it's, it's a wee thing that I've practiced for a while and it's, uh, I'd, I'd noticed that um, I started doing a bit of qigong and stuff, and uh, just the the body's so important they, for yeah. you know just seeing that like that was yeah know. and and we have exercises that we teach people that are involved being out on walks and doing this kind of thing. So you're just uh, jumping ahead of the game there. And do you find that that works for you that practice? Oh, it really, it's it's it's. The, like I say, um, at the start, I've been looking at a lot of, you know, stuff to do with, uh, you know, the intellect, and my, you know, and then it's your body. Like this last while, I've been realizing how important it is to, that even a short walk, that the much you pick up when you just are, you're, you're open the aperture or something like that, you know, that you can just take on so much and that you would normally have must, you know, on a walk. And, you know, it's like I say, but... That's definitely was really, uh, you know, interesting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good way to put it. You're opening the apertures of your senses. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I I, I carried it somewhere. It wasn't me. It made it up on me. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, you stole it for someone. We steal it from you. It goes around that's good. and around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Anybody else? 
want to share their experiences. It's, you know, it's not about anything in particular, really. Jefferson. Yeah, yeah the, for me, it's, um, it's like a, re, a resetting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, time, time definitely, uh, my perception of time disappeared, even though I was present. And um, uh, yeah, like I, I don't, I've done some things, but I haven't gone to smell that way. Like, you know, really activate smell. That was nice. Um, I even for myself, I was like, is that the way I smell? Do I take it? Do I like huff a big air? Or do I do it? Do I do I sniff really lightly when I smell? Is it some questions like that were coming up? So that, yeah, yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And probably the answer is you do both. Yeah. Think about it. if you s smell an unusual smell, don't you go open up your nostrils and, and, and take in more air to get more information? At times, yeah. Yeah, and then at other times you just, you notice, you know, a woman walks by with the right perfume and you go, without, <laughs> with, yeah, she laughs at me, but it's true. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I mean, one thing I notice about how I do it, which, which is kind of an imitation of how I've seen various animals in my life do it, it's like a rapid sniffing, like... <laughs> Because then I feel like I get more of the the scent perception going. I just go like to to clear it out. Yeah, that's how I do it anyway. Yeah, and it's smell is an important sense. Did you know that smell is the only sense that goes directly into the brain, does not pass through the reticular body? Tell us all what that means. Okay, so the information that comes to your senses is filtered by this little chunk of meat in your head called a reticular activating system. And it's the, it's the gateway, it's the guardian. Uh, and it only allows you to perceive a certain amount of the information that's coming in consciously. Otherwise, you'd be totally overwhelmed. If you were to let yourself experience everything that your senses are are picking up right now uh, on an unconscious level if you were to experience that consciously it would be crazy making so the reticular body filters for you yeah and people and, who don't experience yeah. that filter it's it's really it, it can be yeah. wild yeah. yeah but smell goes directly into your brain which is why you can use the sense of smell to activate memory, for instance. Everybody has a memory of when they were a child of that smell coming out of the kitchen. For me, one of them is peanut butter cookies. My mother making peanut butter cookies, if I smell that, it takes me right back to about five or six years old coming into the kitchen and standing around just waiting to take one of those cookies for a test drive. <laughs> yeah. For me, I think it was like a, a sheet pan of brownies when I came home from school. Yeah. And smells will bring that out. When I smell water in the air, on a dry, dusty day. It's, it's something that people don't experience a lot of uh, unless you live in the, like the Southwest or one of the deserts. When the air picks up a little moisture and then it comes to you, you can sense it, you can smell it, you can feel it on your skin. And it's like, when that happens, it takes me back to New Mexico when I was like, five or six years old, standing out in the brush going, going, the rain must be coming. Because that's often what it means. So smell is a, a powerful lead system into all sorts of your memories. And it can tell you things. You know, we smell smoke. We know that there's a problem somewhere. 
Maybe so, it's time to clean your bed sheets. Things like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so does that make sense? <sighs> yes. Good. So, there we have this. This is an exercise that I recommend. This is one of the exercises that we will give everybody. You can't hurt yourself doing this unless you're driving your car. Don't do this while driving your car. Do this while it's safe. Once you've gone through this and you can hold that space, that's when it's perfect to do something like going for a walk. Um, taking in all of those sense impressions. I love doing that. As we've said before, walking is one of our main forms of, of meditation. All right, are it. we? Yeah, oh, go yeah, ahead. Amy. Yeah. I, did, I do it often on the bicycle here and now. Yeah. Yeah, it's when I had uh, a good set of bicycle trails to walk, I would do it there too. Uh, there was a trail I used to ride that went along the Grand River. Uh, and you could get all of the smells and all of the, the sounds and all of the sensations on your skin and all of the beautiful forest and geese and swans, mean swans, swans that didn't like you. I have a question. Is yes. It this exercise, is it, uh, do you make uh, contact with your uh, essence, the, the attention you come from and you sense it? Does it also uh, means that you automatically uh, meet your essence and from there uh, sensing and know knows where you are. If I am understanding your question correctly, the answer is yes. Um, the, here we have the problem with English. Uh, because you're not meeting your essence, that's who you are. Mm. Your essence becomes awake. You are awake. Um, and so it's tricky to talk about it, but it, it, as I'm understanding what you're asking, the answer is yes. Thank you. David, what do you think? I was thinking of an experience I had earlier today where I was getting a little worked up with somebody's tone of voice. I was thinking how it would have been different if I had dropped into something right at that moment. Yeah. This is one of those things where it helps, again, to practice in times of calm and in the chill zone, because then you can apply it to situations that are a bit more heavy, maybe, I don't know what the right word might be, but David, like a situation... Challenging. Challenging, yeah, yeah, such as a moment of what might otherwise be conflict. Yeah, and if you practice this regularly, you will get to the point where you can go through this in seconds. You know, we took, you know, what, three, four minutes to go through that? Yeah. And these days, for me, it's like, you know, those long hallways that have the lights and you're throwing the switches and each switch turns the next section of light on. It's like that for me. It's just pop, 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 pop. And then everything lights up. I like to take my time, but I don't have to. Do you feel like that comes from practice? From that comes experience? from practice, yeah. yeah. So what would you say to someone who does this exercise 
and has some difficult feelings come up as they tune into their body? I would say um, pay attention to, to that and that's an area where you need to do some remedial work. So a good strategy then might be to pivot to doing like a calming breath exercise, right? Yeah, or some self-observation. I yeah. mean, that's a perfect segue. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess what I'm asking is, should someone push, like, go no, through the it, exercise? Okay, you know the old story of the guy who goes to the doctor and goes, Doctor! When I do this, it hurts. Yeah. And the doctor yeah. says, yeah, so don't do that. Right. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. If, especially if you're just doing this on your own and something comes up, and it's possible that something can, because we carry a lot of trauma imprinted in our bodies. Don't try and force it. This practice will be waiting for you. Yeah. And, that's okay. uh, yeah. and the next time you do it, it might not be there. But exactly. yeah. this is where you find somebody who is competent to help you get through it if it's something really big. If it's something smaller, you can just use the self-observation exercise and go through it. Uh, and when I say somebody competent... Uh, I'm usually thinking of somebody with some skills as a psychologist or uh, a counselor, uh, a competent counselor, not a Reiki master. Not that I have anything against Reiki masters, but Reiki masters do something different. So don't go to a Reiki master if you're bringing up trauma. Reiki, go to somebody who yeah. knows how to handle trauma. Yeah, so I just thought that was an important thing to cover because... It is. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no worries. So yeah. we are. Oh, yeah. Jayash. Sorry. Yeah. 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 First of all, thank you for doing the exercise here. And uh, I experienced that uh, whenever I do this, it's like gradually moving from physical to more subtle uh, opening of the perception. Because whenever I was uh, passing through the body sensation, it was like physical. But then after completion of the physical part, then I moved to listening. So it's more subtle. And so subtle, uh, the listening and physical, and then adding to vision, the seeing part. So again, more subtle and then uh, two subtle things and one physical thing, and that helped me to expand uh, my consciousness. And it felt really good. Yay. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, the, I want to, a comment on the Alice question that when he asked that uh, about essence. So I also noticed that whenever I was traveling through my body or listening or seeing, uh, was I awake about seeing my own self doing this? So then I can connect to the essence part of it. Yep. That's a good yeah. thought. Yeah. Yep. And that's just a little self remembering there. I want to make sure we, I actually, if it's okay with you, Mishnak, I'd like to touch base with Zainab and a couple other people we haven't talked to yet. Of course. How did, how did you do with this exercise, Zainab? I liked it as it was very short. Um, uh, going in and coming out and it was a nice whole um, exercise for uh, sensation. Well, nothing coming up. That's perfect. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Zaina. That's great. Omar, how about you? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I did have at least a, a puzzle partway through. No, I, when you when you're saying to become aware of, you know. Uh, both of uh, the hand and the wrist and the arm and so forth. Uh, I mean, there's still a difference, at least in, in my experience, bet between, I guess, be being aware of those and almost focusing on it. Like there's, there's still the spotlight on whatever it is I was focusing, but the light lights up, say, the whole arm. 
is is that kind of what you're aiming for or is yeah kind of like that everything to be the spotlight um i think that you're making the lens of the light bigger and it's probably exciting. stronger at the same time so yeah. ideally you're going to get the same sort of illumination throughout yeah. the entire arm um, but that takes a little practice probably mm -hmm. if everybody pays attention they'll notice where there are blank spots uh, where you don't sense that part of your arm or your leg or your chest or your back um, patches as if you were a cow <laughs> spotted uh, yeah. And those are called areas of sensory motor amnesia, where you have to relearn to sense that part. And this is a practice that will help you over time to relearn that. My calves feel a little vague, for instance. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Over. But even if you're, let's say, I'm, I'm sensing and aware of the whole arm, but I'm still seem to be, you know, like, uh, let's assume I'm still focusing on the wrist. The, the wrist seems you know kind of lights up more than the rest of the arm is that what's to be expected or is that something that, that happens evens out yeah, yeah i that, think similarly yeah. that's like the other side of the coin right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there there's no one right way to sense yourself uh and it's going to be a little bit different for everybody i mean for all i know because i can only feel my own body you guys had totally different experiences than what i did but i'm assuming that it will parse into sort of the same thing okay thanks so much thanks yeah it's it's a good to ponder that yeah good questions someone out there is going to wonder the same thing anyway yeah aaron let us know how it went for you. Jonathan, how did it go for you? When I spread my attention to cover my whole body, I, it had to spread out very thin, very shallow attention. And in fact, I found myself flittering the attention it would be in my head and then my feet and then my arms in my attempt to try and hold the whole body. Whereas when the attention shifted to the, the taste of my mouth, I concentrated it just to, to send the sensation in my mouth in an attempt to discover a taste which I did, but it was that at the expense of losing everything else. Yeah, there it is just takes something practice. of practice to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's completely understandable, Jonathan. Yeah, okay. when I first started learning this practice, it was, I couldn't hardly hold anything in consciousness. I mean, you know, I'd be aware of my hand and then I get to my foot and I forget my hand and you know, it just, it takes time, it takes practice, it takes consistency. Yeah. And, you know, we did a practice run of this earlier, and Mushtaq was walking me through it, and he, you know, just, you know, he was kind of just going over it in brief, so he forgot to do my left arm, and it was as if I had, I, it's like everything was lit up except for my left arm. <laughs> interesting go ahead tell them that i made a mistake i'll live well, it down eventually the reason why i share that is oh, yeah, because <laughs> you and i get to expose you for who you truly are yes yes and i know you love that sometimes it's fun but it's yeah fun. i mean it's it was kind of like because we didn't touch into my arm i wasn't including it in my in my scan in my awareness it was very interesting that way and so i had to just let him know that that happened so then we we went backwards and included it and suddenly it was like i was able to be aware of my body in full very interesting yeah so jonathan i i think your experience makes sense and that's completely normal i just you know i invite you to give it another try at a different time and see how it goes then too perhaps it might become easier 
Yeah, with practice, I can almost guarantee that it will become easier. Yeah. So Aaron says, sometimes it's easier to do than other times. I think if I do it a bit, if I do a bit of breathing exercise first, it's easier to do it with focus. I think that is definitely going to be a common experience, Aaron. So thank you for sharing that. That's a great recommendation. To get the ball rolling with breath practice first, if need be. And Anna says, it's been great to listen. Thank you. The self-remembering exercise helps align the senses and open the heart as the body is more grounded. Yeah, of course, yes. we're, we're going to get to this, to the self-observation exercise next. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, Levita, how about you? How did it go with you? Um, <clears throat> um, I've been working on self self-awareness, but I wasn't thinking about it when the exercise started. And I didn't have any idea of what was going to happen. So it felt like usually those kind of scanning exercises for me always feel like I'm sitting in the dark and turning a light onto different body parts. This time, it felt like I was sitting in a lighted room and then there was a spotlight addressed to each individual part, which felt kind of I like good. that. Yeah, I like that. Good. Yeah. The surprising part was I didn't fall asleep. Because usually by the <laughs> time we get halfway through, I'm like, you know. Oh. <laughs> You know, so maybe I don't know whether it was the nature of the exercise or whether I've actually caught up on my sleep deprivation. You know, I've caught up on my sleep debt. I don't know. But it was good not to be, I'm going to meditate. And then you wake up five hours later. Yeah, we try and avoid that. Yeah. And yeah, you, it's, you it's it, tricky because the same, the, the same exercise can be used to put somebody into a deep trance. Yeah. yeah. And... It's all about how the person who is guiding you through the exercise or how you guide yourself through the exercise that determines which way you go. Right. And I did notice that, that you took the not trancey approach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the trancey stuff is for the other people. <laughs> we don't want to put you into a trance. We want to bring you out of the trance. Yes. All right, so uh, Jefferson says, once I heard that we have two deaths in life, one at the end of physical mortality and one each night, this practice gives a nice counterpoint to the statement. Two births, one out of the womb, and each morning. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that works. And that's, that's actually a... rather to the point because, like I said, this is the way a baby's senses wake up. Yes. If you think about it, the first sense that a baby has is, a, is, or you had as a baby, is the sense of touch, the experience of pressure on your skin, of warmth, of all of the things that touch gives you. Then taste, because once you're born, you got to eat. After that, it's your ears. When... Uh, when we were all primitive and stuff, our hearing was in many ways more important to saving our lives than our sight was. Because if the first inkling you have of the tiger is seeing it, it's too late. You'll find that your body responds to sounds around you uh, very, very quickly. And this is a throwback to those days where we had to rely on our hearing to tell us what was out there before we could see it. So hearing comes before sight and sight comes before smell in humans. Smell is our weakest sense in, in, in the, the sense that we don't have like the olfactory senses of a dog. Dogs actually do that in reverse. Uh, it's smell and then sight. Yes, yes horror, says, horror like, sounds in the basement. Yes, like in scary movies. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I see cool that. Uh, worry, yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, I guess it seems like the hearing and the taste may have been reversed. 
uh, at least if I believe my mom, she took me to concert halls and so forth while I was still in her womb. And uh, I mean, I have had an interesting recalls almost of music and stuff like that. And I and obviously I wasn't tasting it. Well, at least I didn't think I was tasting anything <laughs> in the womb. Is yeah, it's a it's an interesting hypothesis. I mean, you know, I've heard that playing. Bach and Mozart and such things when you're carrying a baby is, is good for the baby. I don't know. I mean, it's not far-fetched because the vibrations are definitely getting in there and, uh, you know, you're floating in uh, something that conducts sound really well. Hmm. So, no, whether one is conscious of that sound, yeah. I don't know. You know, that's not the question, yeah. I guess. But. Yeah, for a part of it, you didn't have ears, so... You would be feeling the vibrations against your skin. Yeah. Isn't that also like a, a child recognizing their parents' voices? Yeah. The question is when, when that happens. Um, I've seen video where this was a baby that was just born, and the baby was they had the baby had come out and they laid the baby down, and the father was videoing, and. The baby started to cry because it's cold, right? Mm -hmm. So the baby starts to cry, and the father goes, I'm here. I love you. I'm here. It's, it's okay. And the baby calmed down like. Yeah. And it was just like, wow. You know, and then every yeah. time the baby cried and he spoke to her, she just, just settled right down. So, I mean. I don't know if it's hearing. Maybe it's not hearing. Maybe it's some other thing. Oh, but other. by that point, it, it can be hearing. Mm -hmm. But whether it's recognizing a specific voice or just the comforting sounds of a voice, I don't yeah. know. I wasn't in the baby's head. Yeah. I mean, we, we like to think, well, the baby's in there floating around listening to us argue and talk and whatever. Yeah. So you'd think that, but like you say, who knows? I just yeah. know don't go in the basement when the basement is making funny noise. <laughs> yeah, that's always good advice. And talk to the baby when it's in the womb. It can't hurt. No, it can't. You know, can't. and even if it doesn't recognize your voice, uh, I think babies instinctively know the difference between a comforting sound and a scary sound. So uh, let's move self -observation. to self-observation before this thing gets so long that even I don't want to watch it. <laughs> so, as I said, uh, in Arabic, self-observation or observation, self-observation is a practice that is called mahasadeh in Arabic and Farsi, and. I was taught uh, a mnemonic for remembering all that it involves. The mnemonic goes like this in Arabic. It goes, Wasafi min al Hawasi Fatra. Wasafi means uh, to describe, a description. Min al Hawasi means uh, from the senses. And Fatra, it's, it's an interesting word because uh, it means a period, a, a period of time, a, a section. And this is the period of time when you are observing something where you make no presuppositions about it. You do not make value judgments upon it. You try to experience what you are observing as it is, rather than as you would like it to be or as you think it is. So, it's you that's describing this. It is... a description of the event of what you were uh, of what you are observing it is sensory based and this is the important part uh, i saw a dog and it made me feel afraid 
the first part, I saw a dog, is pretty descriptive. It made me feel afraid, requires a value judgment. So instead, I go, I saw an animal that appeared to be a dog. And when I saw this animal, I felt a tightening in the pit of my stomach and a tingling sensation in my chest. And I heard a voice in my head saying, that dog wants to bite you. Do you see the difference between that and I was afraid? Afraid always has a set of physical sensations. It may not be the same for everybody. Nobody does fear exactly the same. But when you find fear in yourself, you can describe it uh, using only your senses. I felt the tightening in the pit of my stomach. I felt this tingling in my chest. My sight narrowed down to where all I could see was this animal. Uh, my breathing began to get shallow up high in my chest and go faster and faster. I could feel my heart beating. All of these things. So, the description is always from the eye. It is always based in the senses. And it always is... is a period of time where you do not make assumptions about what you're feeling. You don't say, I feel fear. You actually describe the sensations in your body. Are you following this so far? Any this questions is very, so far? Yeah. Yeah, this is very much like... Uh, the closest thing I've discovered, which is in some ways very close, is Edmund Husserl's phenomenology. Very, very close to the way he did his, his phenomenological reductions on things. He used more words. Big words. Big words, lots of words. You don't need to do that. Nope. I just wanted to say thank you um, for the explanation because those two those two descriptions sounded similar but they weren't and I appreciate the precision because sometimes when you're trying to explain things and you're trying to be precise people kind of go that's semantics and it's not the same no not in this So, who wants to try and do this? Affirmative consent. Or, you know. Okay, here's another part of this. This does not have to be present time. As a matter of fact, it will not be present time. This is another part of the fatra. Taking a period of time and holding it out here. So you can use this on anything that you can remember because memory is experience. You can use it on anything that you are experiencing it, experiencing right now and you can use it on anything that you're thinking you might experience in the future. Let's all try that. Think of an event that might happen in the future. Imagine yourself in it and notice how the event makes you feel. First of all, describe to yourself, you don't have to describe to me, but describe to yourself where you are. Should someone have their eyes open or closed? It doesn't matter. I usually do this with my eyes open, but if I need to, especially if I'm future pacing like this, I can close my eyes so I can see better. It can be, yeah, it's more intense with eyes closed. 
Yeah. So again, this is one of those things where if it's too much, you can do it with your eyes open or you can stop. And it's important yeah. to use discernment on that. So yep. anyways, so, forward. And this doesn't have to be anything scary or anything. No, it, you know, just sometimes feelings are yeah. overwhelming, good or bad. So, we have an imagination for the future. We can observe that, and we can observe ourselves interacting with that, and that's where the self-observation comes in. We experience whatever this idea is. Uh, let me make one up for you, and I'll go through it, and you can see if you can follow me with your own. Um, I'm standing in line at the bank. A couple of weeks from now and I'm there to make a deposit of money I have a big wad of money in my pocket where I get a big wad of money I don't know but I have a big wad of money in my pocket and I'm listening to an argument between a customer in front of me and the teller and I'm not sure what they're arguing about, but the customer's voice is getting more and more what appears to me to be agitated. Uh, it is raising in volume. It is up in their chest. And I notice that there is a, a flush to their skin now. They're getting what I would call red-faced. Uh, they're gesticulating with their arms. They're moving them around. Um, as I see this, I feel a sense of um, tightening in my back between my shoulder blades and warmth in my hands. Um, I feel my body going into um, protective mode, into um, what I call protective mode. My breathing gets deep. Uh, my skin gets warmer because there is blood rushing to my extremities. Um, at least that's why I, I, I'm making the assumption that that's why it is, because I can see the flush in my skin. Um, and I am feeling uh, wary. Wariness for me is a sense in the back of my head, right back here. Uh, And so that's self-observation for me of, of being in that situation, noticing what I would be doing if that were the case. Was everybody able to follow that? Many people were. Yep, thumbs up, yeah. It says yes. Now, why would Sufis or Mr. Gurdjieff want you to do this? Jefferson, why do you think? Um, uh, a lower, uh, you're less likely going to lie to yourself with an interpretation or a judgment about what's mm -hmm. happening. Yes. And what could you get from that? Um, a centered experience of reality and self-awareness and a better yes. reaction to this, perhaps a better reaction to this, perhaps a better reaction to the situation. Yeah. Now, if I'm doing this with something from my past, a memory that popped up, Doing this will take, if it's a, like a powerful negative experience, uh, observing myself as I go through it will literally drain energy from that experience, making it less and less potent for me. Because you're deconstructing it in a way? I'm deconstructing it. I'm bringing it down to its... Um, its constituent parts. 
And as I do that, some of those parts change a little bit, which is always interesting. And when that happens, the feeling changes. It's like, I've done this a lot in my lifetime. And things that were like really triggering for me 25 years ago, I think of them now and I can remember the situation. It's just, eh, no charge. Which is what you want. You don't want to lose situations that involve learning things. So you don't and want to just like, you know, compartmentalize that memory and put it in a box and never. No, you don't necessarily want amnesia for the memory. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that is a strategy, but for this practice. Yeah. 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 If you just give yourself amnesia for the memory, the memory is still there. All of the reactions are still there. They're just buried in your unconscious. And as Freud, one of the few things that Freud said uh, that was correct is uh, what you repress will return. Sneak up on you. Yep, when you're least expecting it. Often messily. Yeah. Yeah. So Aaron says, uh, as far as what were we talking about? This is an answer to what might this practice yeah. serve to do, I guess, was the question. And Aaron said, to not identify with an emotional interpretation, at least not automatically. Yes, and that's important. And Levita is correct too when she says it gives you some emotional distance so you can clarify exactly what it is that you're feeling. And the weird thing is, is that so there is very little difference in, for most people between feeling fear and feeling excitement. Little tiny differences. Not true in every case, but true in a lot of cases. Uh, so, so she, go ahead. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. See with no the, the, this, this again, isn't it? That's just creating that separation and it's non-critical ob observer and yes. you're observing yourself and it's like you're almost like uh making tommy passive <laughs> you know that, and, that, but, and you're you're looking and observing and creating that uh you know again non-critical is the key isn't it you're just yes it is there, you know and that's non-identifying then and it takes the charge out of what's happening because you're seeing it as is. Does that make sense? It does. It makes... And that is very helpful in clarifying why and how this allows for the, the release of the charge that can come up with these memories or these imaginations about the future. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tommy. And uh, Aaron asks, is the difference in anticipation of pleasure versus pain? He's talking about referring to excitement versus fear. Um, could be. Uh, it's interesting because our consciousness prefers pleasure, but it sorts for pain. That's weird, huh? We want to move towards pleasure, but pain will totally capture our attention. Levita says, people who care for children can do this for children in their vicinity. You often see it when a baby is crying and people around the baby who are caregivers will say, that baby is exhausted. That baby is very hungry. That baby is hurting. And they are very often correct. Yeah. And the... Uh, I'm not sure retroactive is the right word, Aaron. Aaron says, so pleasure is a more retroactive interpretation? Um, and I don't think so. Pleasure is pretty in the moment. 
It's not something that, well, you can remember pleasure, but you, you would rather experience it. It's just, if pleasure and pain were both light bulbs, pain would be the brighter light. You would tend to notice it more. If something is going to be painful, it will grab your attention. So, here I have this thing over here, ice cream. There is ice cream over there. There is a snarling dog over here. The snarling dog is going to hold my attention, not the ice cream, though I would rather eat the ice cream. Sacrifices must be made. Yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, uh, Jefferson. Jefferson. Uh, yeah. In terms of what you just had uh, invited us to do with the future pacing, um, to me, there, you're, it's taking something that we mostly we do automatically most people anxiety would be what most people do for the future or depression let's say generically from the past and what i like about it is that it's bringing play it's bringing the possibility for play into the relationship and i, I just was noticing that so. good that's perfect yeah that's true now that i, I sit here with that that yeah. A really and nice equally, yeah, yeah, equally important, it puts you in charge of it. So you are in charge of that experience when you have it, as opposed to it being done to you even by your own mind. Just sometimes no fun at all. Yeah, I want my mind to do the ice cream, but it often does the dog. <laughs> Bummer. That's okay. We'll get you that ice cream. <sighs> Lavita says, we desire pleasure, but we want to be around to experience pleasure, so we avoid pain. Likely so. Yeah. That's a very uh, practical way of looking at it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So do we all feel like we have a sense of how to do this? Do you want me to go through another round of it so you can try it yourself? Let's do that. Yeah. All right. We got some thumbs up. Some people are interested in that. Okay. In this moment, I am sitting in on my desk in front of my desk looking at the computer screen and looking at all of your pictures or at least the pictures that i assume are you i am feeling a warm sensation in my chest and a soft sensation in the belly my breathing is low in my abdomen and I am experiencing a certain amount of energy moving up my, what I call energy, moving up my neck. And as it does, I can feel my neck elongating and my head reaching towards the ceiling. That's just a quick observation of where I am right now. Sensations in my body, I'm not putting any meaning on them. Um, and just checking in for a moment, observing myself now. If there were some other stimulus, like if Noor jumped out of her room, ran over here and started yelling at me, I would have a different, sen a different set of sensations to observe. But it would be the same process of observation. Make sense? So we've had one in the future, we've had one in the past, and we've had one in the present moment. You can do all of them because self-observation does not require you being in the present moment. And as a matter of fact, you can't really be in the present moment um, when you do it because you have to bracket. Yes, that's that word bracketing. Yeah. Yeah, I stole bracketing from, uh, from Husserl. 
he used uh, the Greek word epochi, which means almost exactly the same thing as the Arabic word that we're using. Um, and he described it as bracketing. All right, so questions. Somebody had to. Oh, yeah, Jayesh. Jayesh had to take off. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a, a day ahead of him. Yep. Um, David asks When you do the past one, are you trying to feel what you felt in that moment? No, you feel you... what you are feeling in the moment now about the past. So think of, a, think of something in your past and notice. Notice what what your reaction to that memory is. And it's not what it was in the past. It's what you have right now. Yeah. This is always present time. You're always describing your experience now. But it's your experience of the past, of the present, of the future. And you are experiencing it now. Okay, so that is the key there. Yeah. That is another key to this, along with describing non judgmentally but observationally what is happening. You're talking about what is occurring right now in the body. Yeah. And people will say things like, I feel sad, right, when I'm teaching them this. And it's usually taught one on one. This is actually the first time I think I've ever tried to teach this like this in a group to actually get you guys to do it it's usually one-on-one -on -one and i'll say um tell me what you're feeling and they might say i'm feeling sad and i would go how do you know you're feeling sad where is sad in your body you know That's things like the that door opener. yeah 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 like i am feeling what we could call pain in my back right now but yes. you could describe it instead because pain is kind of, it brings up for me some negative emotions, some resistance. We could say, I am experiencing a sensation of cold in my mid and upper back. I'm experiencing muscles being tense. And I am experiencing tightness of my spine through my neck. So when I describe it that way, it feels much more, in a way, more grounded and manageable. And it also, instead of just saying, oh my God, I'm in pain, it kind of tells me, okay, if I'm feeling tightness, I can do this. If it feels coldness, I can respond to it in this way. And so I have a way of responding to the experience in a way that may relieve what I'm experiencing as pain, as opposed now, to just being emotionally tied up in it. Yeah, one of the things that you can describe, and this is slightly higher order, uh, is what the words in your head are saying. But that's the way that you describe it. So, I feel a sensation of pressure and uh, tenseness in my third thoracic vertebrae. And I hear a voice in my head, my voice, saying, my back sure hurts. And when I say that to myself, the, the sensation intensifies it's more sharp and smaller more pinpoint and then I start talking to myself about how much my back hurts and I listen to that voice and um, it's not describing the sensation it's just telling me what I'm supposed to believe about this so you can begin to add that stuff in it's harder when you're working with the voices in your head the pictures in your head uh, you know, <sighs> Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter is doing this. 
and he describes the the feelings that he's having in his body and all of this and then he describes the picture in his mind's eye of severus snape san standing over him waving his wand and yelling that's part of the experience too because sometimes a visual will come up and you have to describe that in the same non-judgmental uh presuppositionless uh method of description so all of the senses that you used <coughs> in the the sensing exercise you can use that in your self-observation you can describe from physical sensation you can describe from taste even you can describe from what you hear you can describe from what you see and if you're really lucky or unlucky you can describe what you smell it all ties together yes yeah there is method to my madness or something like that so this is also a building block in a way Ooh, Tommy, I saw you unmuted. Yes. Oh, well, I was just going to say quickly, was this, can self-observation be used too to see your, you know, uh, ingrained attitudes and the, the songs you play, <laughs> you know, these sort oh, of... Oh, absolutely. Music. Yes. That, that is, because uh, I, I, I uh, uh, like, this is, so it's like on, a, on an intellectual level and an emotional level and a bodily level, the three, yeah. yep. you know, and... It's sort of shining a light on maybe taking. I love this again. It's from reading some of, uh, of uh, I've been reading the, the In Search of Miraculous and Morris Nicole and stuff. It's the idea of uh, catching glimpses of yourself at the start mm -hmm. and then you shine a light. And then the more you do it, obviously, the more you can see and taking pictures of, your, of yourself. You know, I just thought that was that's the. You do it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, anything that you can experience, you can observe. Thanks, Sometimes Tommy. it's yeah. easier than others, but yeah, you make good points. So, David asks, and this is this is a question that it's good for us all to think about. What are, are those sensory motor amnesia parts? Things that you want to clear up so that you can see them while you're doing self-observation? Um, the answer is in general, yes. Sensory motor amnesia is not a good thing uh, for most people. I mean, if, if you had some massive chronic pain that there was no hope for, you might want to have amnesia in that spot. But in general, you want to be able to be in touch with your whole body. This requires time and work and movement. You, it's difficult to uh, open the places of sensory motor amnesia without uh, being able to move your body and move it through certain ranges that allow you to find that place. Uh, it's a pity Cherie isn't here tonight. She's on vacation. She's having fun down in Melbourne tonight. She deserves uh, it, but yeah, she does. But she, she have plenty to say. Yeah, about she's this, the but... the one who is an expert on that. So questions yeah so as i was just going to say that so this is a building block to what we talked about last week in a way yes of self remembering yeah self remembering self observation self witnessing and creating aims all fit together um, and we're going to talk about self-witnessing and the creation of aims uh, on our, our double Sunday. So that's going to be gonna... just a week from now. Yeah, a week from now. Yeah, it's videos. Any other questions? Any answers? Yeah, you could. You guys have had plenty of answers. Yeah. I guess not. 
Do we have anything else we want to add, Mishtar? Um, it's great having you all here. It makes yeah. it so easy to, to talk. If I had to do this, just sitting here by myself talking into a camera, I wouldn't do it. This is way more fun. Uh, so thank you to each and every one of you for making this possible. Because yeah. if you weren't here, I wouldn't be saying nothing. I mean, we'd, we'd be very, you know, casually talking to each other. There would be no... Yeah. There's no way we would be able to share this with you guys as well as we've been managing to do so because you guys help us do the teaching. Jonathan, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Would you say that practicing self-observation in the present moment is more valuable than practicing self-observation self from an event in the past, which is more valuable than practicing self-observation of an event you're imagining in the future. They're, they're getting more and more unreal. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. For things in the past, because they, they will sometimes leave echoes that come forward and bother you, um, You, the self-observation, as I said before, is always in the present moment, but you might be dealing with something to, and, and be able to release uh, a certain amount of energy. I can give you an example. So, a few weeks ago, I was washing the dishes, and uh, one of our glasses was sitting on uh, the side because we have a very small space for doing this, and we had too many dishes. And I accidentally knocked it off onto the floor where it broke. And I had this moment of um, deep sadness and anxiety come up as if I would never be able to have something like that again. And I looked at it and I went, mm, that's weird. And I did some self-observation on it and found it connected to my earliest childhood when uh, my family was dirt poor. We were so poor, we didn't have dirt. You know, we had to borrow dirt from our neighbors to be sitting on. That's how poor we were. And so if we lost something, it was incredibly difficult to replace it. Even something as simple as a glass. Um, and that moment brought that up for me for no good reason. It was a glass that cost me two bucks at Target and you know, it's nothing to go down and get another one. But that feeling and emotion was buried deep inside of me. And it just came up in that moment and I was able to observe it and see it for what it was and where it came from and the energy that held it and just, let it go. And so whatever was holding that memory deep inside, holding the energy on the memory, I can remember those parts of my past and have no reaction to them now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it was the reclaiming of something that had been stuck in the past. And this is also to show you that no matter how long you've been doing this, there's always going to be a little bit more that you can do. Yeah. I mean, Nobody like ever reaches ultimate perfection in this lifetime, no matter what they tell you. If you are alive in a body, you still have some work you can do. You may never be bored. Yeah, <laughs> that's part of the great uh, Chinese curses. May you never be bored. <laughs> yeah, may you live in interesting times. May you come to the attention of important people and may you never be bored. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, we should, uh, 
at the end of the talk, we can link to our talk that we did about some scars because I think that maybe. Yeah. Did we relevant. do a talk about some scars? We, we must did. have done a talk. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I'll find it. Yeah. Some scars, pain in the butt. But those are those subliminal memory traces that sneak up on you that you can yeah. do this practice on. Great. So I do not have anything to add. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. No, I think that this is good, and I'm hungry. Me too. Be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this. All right. Yeah. So let me shift the view over to gallery, and here we are. So, any last thoughts from any of you? Nope. All right. Jefferson. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh, just, oh yes. it's, you just you're very generous. These these calls are very generous. Just thank you. Well, Everybody. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Everyone. Yeah, remember if you weren't here, thoughts. it wouldn't have been as good. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. I guess we're on Brady Bunch mode, so we can yes. wave to each other. Wave goodbye. And to everyone Say watching thank on you. YouTube. Thanks everyone, and we and will see you next week.